What's up, guys? Welcome to Powerline Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Ryan Lucas. All right. This week's guest, again, another Hall of Fame inductee, uh, the man responsible for creating the Lyman Appreciation Day in North America, uh, and an all-out legend in the industry and trade. I was super stoked to have this conversation with Bill. Um, Yeah, and I just think there's Of course, like every other guest we've had on here, a ton of value in this episode. So let's dive right in. Powerline Podcast with Bill Bosch. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I'm excited to talk to you. Like I just told you a second ago, seen a couple of your videos. I, I've, uh, I know a few of the things that you've been uh, doing for the trade and the industry, just a, a touch of what you've done for the industry. I respect the shit out of anyone <laughs> that, you know, like we we're just saying, pulls history along with us and continues to reintroduce that to the, to the trade and the industry. I think it's important. So like, welcome to the show and a pleasure to have you here. My God, I was kind of getting jealous of everybody that's been on. I, I watch. I'm, I'm a pretty big fan, so I oh, watch cool. you all the time. So it's. I uh, uh, was just watching some some past episodes, and I'm going, man, he's on episode 190, 200. I go, where? How do I get in on this? So it's. Uh, but first, Ryan, just thanks for what you do. It's. Uh, you know, we just don't have enough enough awareness and enough people talking about the right things and the important things. So. Uh, man, kudos to everything that you do and, and uh, uh, much respect. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, yeah, it's like we we're just talking about it's important. The history is important. Mm-hmm. And that's a good piece of why I the, the heart of starting this show was to just take our stories and record them <laughs> in whatever format I could do. I can't I'm okay at writing, but the thought of writing a book just seemed a little bit too big for me. But I was like, hey, I can get some microphones together and plug them into my computer and hit record and talk to whoever wants to talk to me and just like capture that little bit of history and have it pass along. And uh, it's it's a cool way, a cool medium, cool format for doing that. Yeah. And you get to talk to so many people and so yeah. many different things and so many important things. It's, you know, this is I'm trying to figure out how old I am. <laughs> um, this is my 44th year in the trade Dang. and, um, you know, it, it started back as a biggest screw up. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, I started, well, my, my career started with, um, doing three forty five H structures back in Missouri, uh, for a contract company. And that contract company, uh, was getting ready to go to Nebraska in the dead of winter doing steel work. I said, Oh man. So my history, my father, uh, um, Hall of Fame lineman. Um, he was a product manager for AB Chance Company for 25 years. So if you're ever going to pull a card, the dad card out, it's when you're supposed to go into Nebraska in the dead of winter. So I said, you know, is there anything going on in the United States? This is back 1979. And uh, so, well, he goes, boy, I got, I got uh, there's stuff going in Kansas, and and uh, um, my dad's old pole partner, Dit Watley, was in uh, Nevada Power. So he goes, you can go to Vegas. So, hell yeah. I was like, yeah. Beats Nebraska. Let's, in the let's go to Vegas, which was one of the worst decisions as far as my uh, greatest decision for my professional career, but wasn't the greatest decision for my personal life. Yeah. The, uh, um, they got all kinds of things out there in Vegas. So, sure do. Um, but anyway, I went there and I tell you what, um, I went through uh, 396 uh, apprentice program through Nevada Power, and it was probably one of the most comprehensive uh, programs that I've been associated with. Of course, it, you know, it was in a big investor own and it, and it was centered, you know, in that company. And we, you know, we we did everything from secondary to 500. And but if it wasn't for guys like uh, Chris Thermony, who was my line father, he, you know, we we talk about line history and we talk about the people that taught us. And, you know, so Chris there and me, you know, I was his, you know, boy and, uh, he took me under his wing and, but guys like, uh, Dan Wicks and, and, um, Bob Young and, and Cal Puana, Cal Puana was my line grandfather. And, uh, so when we think back, you know, for the young guys that are getting in the trade today, you know, maybe, you know, you can't really know where you're at or where you're going, 
Sure. Unless you know what where what other people have done and and kind of walk in their shoes a little bit and you know I can't thank the people that taught me. Yeah. Because God knows they should have wrote me off on their taxes. So yeah. it was. Uh, so my line f- family and that company is probably uh, the reason for my success today. Yeah. It's. I definitely try to continually give respect to those people like. David Fossa and Ron Tom and my father that, you know, we're my line family as well. And amazing how those names are just there yeah, for us. Always. And uh, um, there's not a day goes by that we we're not associated with something that we see. And we remember exactly uh, when Bob Young taught me that hotline yeah. uh, technique or or a certain part of line or, you know, we all of course, we all drive down the road and say, you know, I built that or we built something like that or. Yeah. But uh, it's amazing on how you just remember those people that taught us, and and I think we we need to get back some of that in the trade. We gotta we gotta get a more historical focus on on what's important. Um, I think we've lost a little bit of that over the years. I want to unpack a little bit of that actually because I I would like question people now whether they have that person or not, and if they don't, mm. that's kind of sad mm-hmm. and what's missing there and why don't they have that person? You know, yeah, you told me there weren't going to be any tough questions. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Though? But like, it seems like it, it, it's not that way for everyone right now, but it, if you go question some of these young, well, maybe not these ones cause they haven't got enough time in the trade yet, but those one, those guys that are maybe five, six years in who, who are these names for you that early stick out? And like, I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, and, and and I think we've we've kind of identified that that's possibly something that's missing, and and through through your show and through um, different communication uh, uh, mediums that maybe we can get that back out there. It's more, you know, all we got to do is just start the conversations, and uh, um, you know, it's for these guys that are that are general foremen and foremen today, and and lead linemen. Um, you know, sometimes we're driven so much by by production that maybe, you know, maybe we just need to step back and realize that, you know, the trade's not going to be where it needs to be 10 years from now if we don't get the next generation ready. And, uh, we, you know, I don't think it's I don't think it's the fault of the present crews. I just think maybe if we just refocus a little bit, I, I think they, you know, I think they know it. Yeah. And uh, um, and they just. You know, it's if if we can improve a part of the trade, maybe our discussion will will spur some more of that historical um, line family discussion. I think it's important also for us seasoned and the ones st- like not even us, not even myself, but the ones that are out there still grinding every mm-hmm. day in the field to continue to bring that person under their wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, maybe they've done it a hundred times already. Maybe they're a little bit tired of doing it, but like, man, that's a great legacy to continue. Like find the next guy that's showing some interest, bring them under your wing, teach them what you know. Like it's a trade. It's a trade. Yeah. It's a craft. You know, and I think it goes hand in hand with organizations like, like here um, or the line schools and different organizations that are in the nation. Um, you know, Gosh, six, seven years ago, there was 40 or 50. Now there's 140 or something out there. And uh, for our organization, uh, um, you know, it's something that we can give a message to these new guys that are coming out. The, you know, one, what level do they graduate at? Because they're not graduating as an apprentice or a lineman. They're graduating at at best. They're qualified to go into a groundman position, pre-apprentice position. One, they got to understand that. Yeah. And the other one is, okay, make yourself, what's your value and what's your worth to that crew? You know, when they're eating, you know, when they take lunch, you're eating a sandwich standing up. Uh, You're getting material ready. You're getting this ready. So it's these young guys got to realize they have to put in an investment for that lineman or that that foreman to invest in them. And sometimes, you know, they... You know, we'll take a break, and there they are laying on the ground beside us. Well, that's a bunch of hooey. Yep. You know, it's yep. uh, 
Um, if you want to be taken under the wing of somebody, you got to give them value and reasons mm-hmm. for to be taken under that wing, I think. And maybe it's an education that we can teach these young guys. Yeah. And I think that's our responsibility at, at our, you know, at, at our school here, too. Yeah. These young guys. And if you're listening to this, uh, everything's a test. Mm-hmm. It's just like there's one episode one episode of Yellowstone that I really, really love. Okay. But many episodes of Yellowstone. But this one where Jimmy goes to the four sixes and he shows up at the four sixes. Oh yeah. And that old boy comes, sits down beside him and gives him a plate of food. And he's like, Oh, do you have Jimmy's like, Do you have any cutlery? Do you have you have a fork? And he's like, Make a sandwich out of it. <laughs> like just do you, figure it out. Yeah. And later on in the episode, Jimmy tells his girlfriend, Everything's a test here. I have to show up early. Like, cause she's like, why are you showing up early every day? I have to show up early. Everything's a test. Everything's a test. But like, yep. that's the fact out in the field too. Like when you're sitting down beside your lineman, relax and chill and you're getting tested. Yeah. It's judging you. Oh my God. They, <laughs> you know, so uh, back in, again, like in 79, 80 and stuff. I mean, you know, I talk about, uh, getting material and rain stuff. But the big thing back then is, you know, the foreman's truck, the windshields better be clean and that cab better be clean. And, and, uh, um, if you're on Tom Hazelwood's crew, he better have a clean truck to get in there. And so we can just replace the name for whatever crew you're on. Facts. Yeah. But you know, it's, you know, they are not going to put time into you. If, you know, if the young people that are listening and, and getting in the trade, you know, they won't invest in you until you're, until you're a great investment. Yeah. That little tool bag I had as an apprentice mm-hmm. had boom wax in it, yeah. had a little bottle of Mother's or Armor All, yeah. that rag. Like, if there was nothing to do, there was something to do. I had Absolutely. a little broom, little little dust broom, like sweeping the floor of the bucket out. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I don't know, it's those little stupid little things. Yeah, the but, and, and maybe it's generational. Maybe it's the entitlement um, that the younger generation has. But... That needs to all go away when it comes to line crew. They they gotta they gotta prove their value. Yeah. So, talk about your father. And oh my gosh, AB Chance and yeah. Um, well, my first official job that I don't think I get in trouble now. But when I was 14, 15 years old. Dad would put me in the foundry on the midnight shift. I'd be in there pouring metal and uh, didn't get paid for it. But it was just like okay, go sweep the floor, go you know this kind of stuff. But uh, dad was, uh, uh, his name is Cliff Bosch and, and, uh, um, actually he died on April 18th and, uh, I had the pleasure of writing, um, uh, national alignments appreciation day and got it passed through Congress back in 2012 and voted on in 2013 by our, by United States Senate. And, uh, um, April 18th uh, was the day he passed, and that's the day that I selected for that only because um, it, it could be, you know, it doesn't matter what day it is. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it's a day that we celebrate what alignment is and who alignment is. And, and uh, but dad was, um, you know, I think he was probably the ultimate lineman. Um, he started in the military, alignment in the military, and then he went to Kansas for a company there and then, and then was a demonstrator for AB chance company for a number of years. And man, I got, I had, man, it was, I got to play golf with all the demonstrators when I was a kid. And I, you know, I got this, I don't know how, what can we say on here? You know, I used to sit, yeah. I used to sit in the golf cart and, you know, they'd give me a glass of whiskey along with them. And it's just like, uh, you know, we didn't tell mom, but yeah. sorry, mom. The, uh, um, but, um, when he was a dem- demonstrator for chance, a lot of the tools that we use today were developed during that time. You know, you know, a lot of the innovation and grounds were, were done during that time and, and, uh, grounding techniques and all this kind of stuff. So he was on that forefront of a lot of, um, innovation of tools and process that, that we still use today. And, and, uh, you know, I think that's probably why I'm a little bit crazy, a little bit driven that, you know, I, I was such a screw up as a kid and in the, in the front of my career that even today I'm trying to make up for that, <laughs> make up for it's just like, sorry, dad, it's, uh, yeah. um, and anything that I can do uh, or that we can do, you know, we're sitting here talking about the trade and, 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's, everything's got to be for the, for the trade, you know, all linemen. I mean, I love union. I love non-union. It doesn't matter if they're out there, if they're out there putting the time in and, and, you know, keeping the, keeping the grid running. It, it's, uh, um, I want to support the entire industry. And, uh, I mean, I came up through 396. I admit it was a great, a, a great education, yeah. but, um, if we can, uh, make a better trade, and if we can, you know, a lot of things that dad taught me as a kid and, and, uh, we still, you know, you just, you just got to do things right. You got to be a good person. And, and, uh, and no matter what your main goal needs to be helping somebody else get better in the trade or helping somebody get in the trade or helping somebody stay alive. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, um, yeah. So dad's a pretty cool cat, you yeah. know, he, he died quite a few years ago, but, uh, um, love him to death. Um, I was talking to, it was a while ago now, but there's an old boy I had on here, uh, Don McLennan. Oh yeah. Can you, you know, Don uh-huh. Red Dog? Yeah. Um, he was talking about building 500 KV lines. Uh, his father built a lot of the 500 KV lines in British Columbia. And he remembers as a kid, just, you know, sitting in the pickup, rolling down the 500 right away yep. with his dad at work, yep. you know? pretty crazy what you could get away with and what you could do back then. But he's like, every day was take your kid to work day. So, <laughs> well, it, you know, you mentioned, so we talk a little bit what, you know, what linemen do and, and, uh, um, and I mentioned a little bit about Lyman's day, but, um, so I'll break the news here on your show. Um, so we have legislation in Congress right now, um, to help Lyman be recognized as first responders. So um, I won't mention any of the congressional officers or um, um, now, but the legislation is is sitting in uh, committee, and uh, they're reviewing the wording and and uh, what we can do to give Lyman the distinction of first responder. And what that means is that they're recognized with our fire, our police, our military. Um, our um, uh, medical, uh, so all the first responders that are nationally recognized, um, that we would add linemen to that list. And we all know during catastrophic events that uh, uh, we got to go in many times before any any of those first responders can go in. You know, there might be phases down, there might be a, a lot of different situations. Yeah. Um, so we have that legislation on the Hill right now, sure. and, uh, hopefully we'll have something, uh, by Lyman's day in April. Uh, if not, we'll just keep working it and, uh, um, uh, but we'll see, uh, um, to see if we can get Lyman the national benefits as first responders, you know, and there'll be a lot of, um, um, private business benefits too, you know, stuff like that. But, uh, um, just the recognition of the work they do and the dedication and the sacrifice that the families make uh, for them being first responders, I think is important. So that's sitting there. We'll see what we can do with it. I really like that because I know it's controversial. Like mm-hmm. You especially see it online. Mm-hmm. Are you a first responder? Are you not a first responder? How dare you classify yourself in that? And But if I could encourage anybody to just like, let's just take a step back for a second and look at it look at really what we do do as well like and like you said the sacrifice to the families we might not be immediately um you know restarting a heart or you know patching somebody up like you think the military or you know that sort of first responder medics or whatever but man we are in indirect ways we're starting Mm -hmm. We we're putting the power back on that street and somewhere on that street was in old folks home with people on oxygen desperately need that power back on mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever the scenario is, if people just take a step back for a second, just think about all the ways that we do help. Like you said, we're first in, like, what does that take? Everybody's leaving the city mm-hmm. and we're rolling in. Or sleeping in the truck in the yep. middle of a hurricane. Absolutely. You're not sleeping. You're just sitting there waiting for the wind to stop blowing. And then you're out there in no, you're not eating good food. Nothing's open. You're, you know, sleeping all of the things. And I could list them a mile long. Oh, absolutely. It's deserved. Yeah, I think it is. And, you know, and, you know, probably even you or I, or, or, um, I would say the majority of linemen, um, don't care and they don't want the recognition. Sure. Um, because we don't do it for that. You know, everybody out there is doing it for, um, 
the community. Yeah. Um, the people that are, you know, catastrophic events, um, many, many times, um, you got to tell them to shut down because they're just going to keep working. They'll work for days on end, nights on, and you actually got to protect them or us from ourselves because yeah. we'll just keep working. Yeah. And, uh, so it's not that, you know, linemen and the line industry is not asking for the recognition. Yeah. They, uh, they never would. Yeah. Um, but for public awareness, public education, um, and giving them some of the benefits that they deserve for being a first responder, I think that's where it comes. Yeah. Um, but I don't think any lineman out there is ever going to say that I deserve that recognition because I don't think there's one out there that believes that. Yeah. So fair enough. Like a lot of military personnel don't absolutely. want the recognition either. Mm-hmm. They go for different reasons and they serve for different reasons. It, Again, it's not necessarily for the person now, right? It's for all the future generations and all of those reasons you just stated. That recognition means other things than just like that individual recognition. Sure, if you don't want the recognition, fair enough. But it means special different things for different reasons for later, you know? Well, and you just mentioned something that's probably very important for us to discuss. It's it's the future. And... um, You know, old farts like me are retiring here pretty soon, and you got whole generations of baby boomers retiring. Okay, that's the next two, three years. Um, But then we go into these generational discussions, and um, just think about the discussions you see in the political arenas as far as rebuilding the system. Um, that doesn't mean just rebuilding transmission lines. I mean, it's got, it's got to be from the generation station to the meter yep. to be able to handle what, whatever politician you listen to as far as, you know, elect, you know, the electrical demand on the system and stuff. So, sure. you know, we better, we better do a good job of getting more people into the trade. So whether it's through line schools, where the, whatever the, whatever the path is, you know, I'd like to see them go through a line school because I think that gives them a little head start on what they're going to be required to uh, when they hit that first six months on a crew. But when you talk about the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, I mean, there's not, there's not enough people in the pipeline to be able to do uh, what is going to be the demand on our electrical infrastructure. And, and we, we better figure out how to, how to get more people in the trade. Um, if you're listening, there's pretty good money in it. <laughs> the, yeah. uh, um, but also the, um, you know, I always tell students, you know, wait to that second year to buy that $80,000 pickup, but just think about that statement. You know, in two years you get to buy an $80,000 pickup. Yeah. You know, with an $80,000 trailer. Yeah. I, you know, and, uh, so we better figure out a way to strengthen our numbers. Yeah. Uh, especially in the next five years. Because that demand's coming, whether we have the the people to do the work or not, and uh, we better we better have enough people coming up through through the apprenticeships, you know, all over the nation to to be able to be ready for when that demand comes. Like Mark, I was just in Florida mm-hmm. at the outside apprenticeship conference. Yep, and it was eye opening because right now we have this little like low where you. Uh, Apprentices are finding it hard to find work at the moment. And mm-hmm. there's a little bit of this right now where it's a little, little slow, a little pullback. Mm-hmm. And this industry, this current modern industry, uh, they're not, they've never seen it before. They've never seen a pullback before in the last 10 years. Right. So they're all like, you know, freaking out. There's nowhere to go. Why do you need all, you keep talking about all these people. But then you hear from the leaders of the industry, whether it's the IBW, NECA, like whatever it is, American Line Builders, the money that's about to be poured into infrastructure and Mm -hmm. you know it, I know it because I'm privy to it. Yeah. But those guys out in the field right now in the trenches that don't get to have these conversations or listen to this guys, like it's billions, billions with a B with a B. Yeah. Uh, If not moving towards the T the trillions going into infrastructure in the next 10 decade, two decades, whatever. Well, and you know, and we talk about these young guys that, that, maybe have been laid off or whatever, but, but, you know, they need to take the blinders off a little bit and they need to be willing to go out and be getting experience wherever they can, yep. you know, for the next two, three, four years and be prepared for when that call comes. Just don't sit at home and just say, I can't get a job. Yep. You can go out there. I don't care if it's working for a tree crew, working for a telecom crew, 
uh, shit, we got people out there in telecom starting to pay, you know, $30, $32 an hour. Pretty darn good pay. Yeah. And, uh, but yet they're out there learning something. They're out there working. And uh, when the call comes, they're more more prepared. And, and so, you know, that it's it's more that we need to teach these young people that are that are just coming up. Yeah. And uh, they all want to go to uh, a specific company, a specific local, a, a specific type of work. Well, you know what? That might not be possible yeah. at, when you get started. But the, the key is get started. Yeah. And start getting experience because the call comes, you know, who are they going to call? You know, so. And understand that, like, a, a career is long. Like, we're mm-hmm. sitting here talking about working in the late 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. right? Shh. Yeah. No, but that's a <laughs> fact. Like, it's a, and you're still working. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so these, the references, these guys want this now. Like, I should be here. I should be doing this now. I should be at this contractor. Like, you just said. Just go get some experience with something. Yep. Understand that your career is long mm-hmm. and you're at the very beginning of it. Yeah. yeah. You know, get experience. The other thing I'd say for these these younger guys is maybe don't make some of the mistakes that some of us older guys have made, like myself. But, you know, I'd be nowhere without my family. You know, my wife right now, she, you know, I mean, just don't mean right now. I mean, I'd be nowhere if, yeah. if it wasn't for her and, and my kids and the family and and, uh, you know, as you're working these hours, as you're going through your career, don't lose don't lose sight and don't lose fact that that, that family is going to help you get there. And uh, one thing about uh, Lyman, some, sometimes we forget that. And uh, um, I know I did. Um, but, you know, my last 20 years, I, I, I think I grew up in the last 20 years. Sure. And uh, um, so as you know, anybody out there that's that's getting ready to go through it. Or maybe, you know, maybe you've been in it 10, 15 years, you know, cherish your family, take care of your family, and uh, it's only going to help you in your career. You know, they're going to be there to support you. So what other advice do you give while we're on this to these guys coming in or just entering or heck, even those guys that have been in for 10, 15 years? The, you know what, I think there's just some key words and, um, trust and respect and uh honor um be humble i mean honor the ones that taught you um uh pass on the experience pass on what you know life lessons it doesn't necessarily have to be about line work but as you you know as you as you know it could be you know younger guys that are in our care or you know or crew or whatever but you know let's let's take care of one another um, you know, so I, I think it's just living right, having a lot of fun. I mean, God knows we know how to have fun. Um, but you know, be honest, earn, earn trust and be humble. And, uh, you know what, you know, we all always talk about safety and, and, you know, we should probably never have any discussion that we don't talk about safety. Um, um, I wrote an article one time called man in the mirror. And you can look it up on, on, on it's probably hanging in four or 500 break rooms around the United States. And it's, it's basically who's the one person that's going to tell you if you're doing it right, if you're, if you're screwing up and it's that, you know, it's that person that's looking back at you in the mirror and it's, it, you know, that person is going to say, Hey, you know, you're, you're being a butthead or, you know, but, you know, just live right. Be honest. Um, help your crew, help your apprentice, help your groundman, um, just be a positive part of other people's lives. I think that would be the advice I give to people. I love that. I love that. Uh, Quan has been talking a lot about trust this year. Mm. Um, just got back from their president's meeting a few weeks ago as well. And it was the theme for that meeting. And they like to pick a theme for these meetings mm-hmm. and, and kind of roll with it. And a couple of things that came out of that are, that I really liked and uh, along the lines of trust, like one kind of quote, I guess, or whatever pairs with this is like, you got to give trust in order to receive it. So you can't just like necessarily expect people to trust you Mm -hmm. always, right? Trust me. Why? Why should I trust you? You first might have to hand that trust out Mm -hmm. freely, not with no expectations first. And I I loved that because it's true. Yeah, it's true. You know, um, 
I had a conversation not too long ago, and it, it just so happened to be a, a little bit about the trust and stuff. But um, and actually, I think I watched one of your last episodes with Matt with Matt Comfort, and uh, um, and the uh, you know the the new way of looking at safety and and mm-hmm. um, tailboards and and uh, so Matt uh, does a great job when he's talking to people, and you know he's and he, you know he adds that mindset into um, like the energy wheel and trust and, and uh, uh, tailboards. And it's, it's uh, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to pull the episode back up. There was a couple of key things that he said in that. And, and, um, but I, it goes hand in hand, you know, it's when you're talking about uh, um, work on the crew, you know, you're trusting that the other person's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And uh, I think Matt, put it pretty well on one of that one of your last episodes yeah yeah he's got a great way of putting things honestly the capacity model is it's rocking through the entire mm-hmm. industry not just line industry but it's really great model for safety regardless of the industry it's just i love the fact that we're getting off of that you know there's going we, we want to go for zero incidences mm-hmm. because Everybody that works in any industry knew as soon as they come out with that zero incident thing, it was bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like, <clears throat> come on, I'm a human being. And I love the capacity model for that because it's saying, hey, <laughs> we understand there's going to be an incident. It's not mm-hmm. if, it's when. Yep. So let's talk about the shit that's going to kill you yeah. and let's build capacity to fail safely. And it's just, it's simple, but it's just. It's perfect. It puts the mind in a, in a, in a different thought pattern, mm-hmm. especially, you know, when we're out, if we're out on the job and we're thinking about, um, you know, the way we used to think, the way we used to do tailboards and the way we used to identify. Now we identify things in a much different light. It, it's a different vision. Yeah. And uh, so it's revolutionary. And, and I congratulate them for, for pushing that because, you know, when it first came out, I was wondering, okay, is this just going to be a quanta thing? And and but it's uh, the funny thing is, is is it's right, and when things are right, it catches on. And uh, so I think it, you know, this is just one of those huge things that help the industry be better. Yeah. So, um, before I lose the thought, go back to your uh, and share the story about your father and. Oh the space station and oh god uh, the whole deal i don't want, uh, i didn't want to miss that that was the uh oh yeah um god it, it's only the old guys are going to remember this yeah. it's uh if you remember skylab back in the day um skylab was put up into space and and um I don't know if I should tell all this story. Go for uh, it. Go for it. <laughs> um, but the sun, uh, for lack of better words, the sun shield wouldn't open up right. And uh, there was a cable that was keeping one of the sun shields that opened up. And without that, then the, the heat was going to damage the, the living quarters and it was going to, uh, the project was going to be a massive failure. And, and uh, so there's actually a, um, um, a show out called saving Skylab. You can look it up. It's uh uh, it was pretty fun to make. Um, uh, I got to work with NASA and, and Chance and uh, just be part of the project. But um, so uh, NASA um, heard that there was this uh, company that made telescoping sticks. And uh, so NASA's private jet flies into a uh, um, little airport in Boone County in Missouri and you know, they show up in the, the black Lincolns or whatever. I can't, yeah. I, I don't know if that's exactly true, but yeah. uh, they grab dad and, and uh, they tell him the story. And, and uh, so dad throws a bunch of stuff in boxes, literally extendo sticks and cutters and different tools. And of course they were all adapted to like non-sparking because you had to have that up in space and stuff. But so he calls mom from the plane, right. And says, uh, I'm not coming home. Uh, you know, and secret mission, <laughs> secret mission. Can't tell you. Okay. Uh, mom pretty much called bullshit. You know, where are you? Are you at the bar? What's going on? You know, are you with Kepler? What, you know, it's, uh, there's some old, old, old friends from town and, and, uh, demonstrators. And, and, uh, so once she believed them and everything, then, um, uh, he actually got to work with the astronauts, like in the pool and, you can see the, I got pictures where they're at the table and they're put, they're putting tools together. And 
And so you've heard of the million dollar toilet seat, right? Yeah. Well, so if you watch the film, everybody knows that. So they adapted these tools, right? Telecopying school tools. And, and uh, um, it, actually, it's an old Missouri tree trimmer. If you look at it, and you know, it's got the rope on it. And, and no kidding. Yeah. So it's uh, so the it, they they change the design to everything but but if you look at it i mean it's the base it's, of it is that the yeah. base concept is you know it's a pair of cutters that you extend it out and you're able to close it and you know it was you know the concept started as the old missouri tree trimmer you know you know had the little uh p line on it and you used to just cut limbs with it and so cool so but they adapted it all and, and it, it became a pretty cool tool if you watch it yeah you actually see them doing the exercises down in the water and then uh there's actually film of them doing it up in space. Of course, end of the day, they uh, they cut the cable. The sun shield came open. Say save Skylab, and and so just he got to be part of that. He got to be part of a lot of you know a lot of cool things in his life, and and uh, he was he was not apologetic to anybody. I mean, it was you know you can talk to guys that used to travel with him when they when he was a demonstrator, and you know you used to get back in the old Lincoln Lincoln and. And uh, um, that's where the story will end. <laughs> so, so, but uh, you know, back then the trade was a little bit different, and you know, men were men. And uh, you know, I don't. I'd like to think we could hang with them, but I don't know. They were, they're they were a special breed. breed. Yeah. yeah, some would say a different species. To yeah. be honest. <laughs> yeah, the. Uh, um, I think the trade's better off with the innovation and the safety and the things we've done, but. Um, you know, there you just got to look. That's all part of that history that we talked about earlier. You're you know? 100% right. You got to hand it to, you know, the people of the day. They were doing the mm-hmm. best they had with the tools they had and the yeah. abilities they had and the technology they had. They were yep. just, they were doing the best with it. And like, so that's it. That's what it was. It is what it is. You can't change it. Yeah. You know, you know, one of the things back when, you remember all the content, every, lineman that ever came up i think did grounding exercises on that little bit ab chance simulator with the little alligator clips and stuff okay yeah and then um over the years equal potential grounding came out and then so we're all having the debates over equal potential grounding we're having the debates over uh bracketed grounding we're having uh, those debates are still going on today yep. and it's just like um you know it, it's you know, depending on the situation, depending on the systems, depending on the regions, what's what's the best way to ground and stuff. But, I mean, how cool is that, that all these discussions that were 20, 30, 40 years ago are still going on today. Yeah. And we're trying to better the trade and better the, the practices and procedures that we use. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah. I do like that we have a few better tools now than, we, <laughs> than, a, than a chain. Well, I'll tell you another <laughs> bad story. So, so um I don't know if um, some of the older guys will remember when, like, shotguns and, and hot sticks used to have a little seam that ran. It depend on that's how they made them back in the 60s, 70s and stuff. So as they as the tools started to get better uh, um, or made different, and then, then they had a seamless procedure where they spun the fiberglass and that kind of stuff. But so when Dad, we used to bring sticks home, right? And he would bring home shotguns and stuff. And, oh, God, I thought he was going to kill me. The... Uh, so I took one of the new tools that he came home. He was preparing. So, so what did I do? I went out in the backyard and I was pole vaulting with no this. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> Go and so I was pole vaulting. <laughs> the end of the shotgun was going in the dirt. So he pulled the shotgun out to do a demo the next day, and the whole end of it's full of dirt, right? And and uh, wouldn't work. And oh. and uh, so um, I wasn't allowed to touch any of his sticks after that. So yeah, that's. Sorry, Dad. Yeah, so, another one. <laughs> uh, Hopefully, you made up for that one. I right didn't. Now. <laughs> I, I think I got whooped over that one. Man, it, talk about some of the dumb things you did with your dad's tools. Or I, my my dad had a a brand new lift of two by six by twelves or something, and my brother and I got a hold of this brand new lift, and we decided we were going to build tree forts one day. So Dad comes home, and we just got this absolute mess of wood all pounded together in these trees. And we were all proud of these tree forts we built. And yeah, 
shaking his head like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we traded a lot for those <laughs> yeah we traded yeah. a week's worth of work just for these this lift of two yeah, or you grab your dad's coin collection and go buy so sodas with it <laughs> so, yeah yeah i'm not proud of a lot <laughs> damn talk about the transition into uh leadership and mm. instructing and passing you know, on to the next generation you know i've had a um great career um as i was coming up through um uh, nevada power uh, i got um i took a position in the dispatch office 24-hour dispatch office and um that's where i learned um purchase power per power contracts back in the day we used to um buy power on hourly contracts and different things. And, and a lot of people don't see that end of the work. Mm -hmm. And then that same side of the office uh, was the transmission dispatch office. Um, I got to work a lot in the uh, distribution dispatch. So uh, in a town like Vegas, a uh, storm come through, you might have a hundred breakers click like that. And um, so that started my, um, my transition into management uh, at that time. And, uh, from there, um, um, I kind of knew where I wanted to go. Um, I wanted to get into operational management as far as uh, line crews. And, and uh, um, so I had an opportunity to uh, from Las Vegas to go to Vermont. Um, That's and, quite the... Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a couple reasons for that. Um <laughs> Uh, I won't say that on TV. We can just guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I had a guy that took a chance. I mean, I'm a young guy. I'm in my late 30s, um, maybe 40 at the time, and got a line superintendent's job at that time and, and was um, pretty quickly recognized by uh, Vermont Electric Co-op, which um, uh, holler out to those guys. Those are some of the best linemen that I've ever worked with. Uh, worked with a lot of great linemen. Um but everybody knows a co-op system isn't by the road and and uh in the middle of winter when you're dragging transformers out on a sled and you know by your shoulders and you're working out and you know in that time and you know these guys are just phenomenal but um i was able to secure a position there and and uh then went up into upper manage for the for that company um for i was spent 11 years so i was about 16 17 years in nevada at nevada power and then about 11 years in vermont and then I came back and took a, a position in Georgia um, and pretty quickly went into uh, a director slash CEO job of as a municipal. Um, again, some of the best linemen, you know, it doesn't matter where you go. Yeah. The, uh, these guys are amazing. Um, but from there, I was contacted by Northwest Lyman College. Um, I've known Aaron for years and Alan and, and uh, Don Harbuck and some other guys and, and, uh, uh, asked me if I'd be interested to make a change. And and uh, uh, at that same time, I had started a nonprofit called the National Association of Journeyman Linemen, whose entire purpose is just public awareness and, and uh, respect for linemen. Um, but at that time, uh, um, about eight years ago, um, I came over to NLC uh, as a campus president. Um, and I started in California at the Oroville campus. Uh, great people, uh, great community. Um, but I was hired to uh, build and start the Florida campus uh, down in Edgewater. Um, since then, I've had the honor of working with every campus. I've had the honor of, of being a senior vice president for this company. Um, and presently, I'm transitioning into a uh, apprenticeship position that's going to be working with hundreds of companies across the United States and uh, um um, working in the apprenticeship side of the house. And so my, you know, it, but it all started with a Windex bottle, you know, explain. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's, and if you don't get taught right at the beginning and we talked about our line family, we talked mm -hmm. about who taught us. And if you don't learn that stuff at the beginning, you're going to have a hard road. Yeah. And, uh, it all started with cleaning Tom Hazelwood's cab of his truck, and it ended up being a CEO of a utility. It ended up yeah. being um, where now, um, uh, you know, I'm 62 years old. You know, I got four or five years left. And at some point, 
money kind of goes to the side and you know you still want to make money you know, you for know, sure you know unless i still want to make money yeah <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, um, but it's you know you want to talk about um what more can you do for the people that sure. are going to be in the trade and and that's how i want to end my career and and you know i'm you talk about legacy and you talk about your parents you talk about the people that taught you you know at some point you better do something that they're proud of and uh that's where i'm at yeah and uh so i think um i think that's where you're at i yeah. think because of what you're doing it's uh uh you're bringing awareness to a lot of people that watch and and like i say I, i'm a fan i i watch as many episodes as possible and so i think we're kind of on the same mission yeah and uh it's funny how it some more, yeah, yeah like that's what i wish i could uh if if I got asked the question, what would I tell my younger self? You know, mm-hmm. like well, what advice would I give? It would be that, like that, that part that is the career is long in the beginning. It's going to be all about you. And when you get towards the end, it's going to be all about other people. And if you could just understand that sooner and just start making it more about other people when you're younger, mm-hmm. you're going to be way better off. Like yeah. the sooner you can grasp that. And if you're young out there and you're still like, you listen to that right there and you're like, eh, maybe, yeah. you know what? One day, if you're lucky enough to get a little long, more long in life and you've done a few things right and survived it, you know, you're going to realize that, that you it's know, not about you. Anymore. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right. Cause I, I was that cocky little shit on when I, when I said I started in three forty five H structures, right? So we're in the middle of a cornfield in uh, uh, Sturgeon, Missouri, going out. This line went across Missouri and and uh, muddy cornfield. Lyman said, "You know, come over, come over and carry me." I ain't come over there to carry you. Are you crazy? Just walk to the truck. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I I didn't know how much it was going to take, but I know how many they had. So we had a we had an old ninety foot condor steel boom construction truck. So they all put me in the bucket and they went up there and taped me to the X braces. So I look, I looked like Jesus tape, you know, they didn't care. They took the white black tape taped, you know, and uh, so, and left me up there and what pissed me off or made me mad. Sorry. Um, That's um, awesome. That they went down and ate my lunch. And so anybody that knows, you know, don't eat my lunch. So, <laughs> Um, so they left me up there for a good hour and a half or so. And then next, you know, next day, Lyman says, come over and carry me. Damn Skippy, how, how far do you want to go? You know, do you want me to polish your hooks while we're going? You know, but, it, you know, that's where, you know, that's where it all started. And that's where we, we form our beliefs to, to how we operate today. And if we if, you know, go back to earlier in the in our talk, it's if we can teach anybody something, it's it's. It's it's how you come up through, um, and if you respect the history, you respect what you, the knowledge and what you learned, and and the, it's going to make those later years a whole lot better. Mm-hmm. You're going to appreciate it a whole lot more. I get really, I get really kind of hurt when I hear like it, I see a lot of stuff online, right? And it's kind of a bad place to judge the entire industry is what you see off of like TikTok or Instagram, but it gives you a good kind of baseline and it's sad when people say things on there like there's no brotherhood i don't know what this brotherhood is or i don't like and it just makes me sad for them mm-hmm. because it's i don't know i'm i'm only 20 i'm only 25 years into the industry mm-hmm. but you know my 25 years plus all the shit i experienced with my father going through the industry i've never seen they're never known to not have that brotherhood, yeah. you know, sisterhood, whatever yeah. connection there. It, so it makes me sad for these people who are in the industry and they've never had that. They don't feel that. That's that's too bad. And it's like, I just want to help support and bring that back because, you know, you spend this long doing one thing. Like, why can't you love it? Why can't you be proud to be a lineman mm. like it, or in that – Oh, it's just a job. It just it's just money. It's for you know. I don't live to work. I work to live. Work work to live. Mm. Live to work. Whatever the yeah. freaking saying is. But like, man, you gotta enjoy what you do. Yeah. You have to enjoy what you do. Yeah. If not, go find something else to do. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to like, say I'm glad you just said it. God's gonna say, man, if 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 they're like that, go find go find another job. <laughs> you know, it's one you don't respect. You don't respect the history. You don't respect what what people did before us to get us to where we're at today. Cause you, you, you know, you have no problem reaping the benefits 
Um, but you know, if that's, if you can't respect it, just get the hell out, go do something else, you know? Yeah. But, um, you know, I think those are the possibly, I hope it, they're the exception. I hope they're maybe, you know, they'll wash out. Yeah, they um, are. And you but, know it. Cause you without always, getting yeah. somebody hurt, I hope, yeah. but yeah. you get so much of that negative online and you get the negative, the negative is public facing online. Mm-hmm. So it's in the comments and it's so you get mostly like negative stuff, but all the positive feedback you get is in the private side, the DM side, or, mm-hmm. you know, and there's just as much of it on the positive side. It's just, a, it's not public facing. Yeah. They don't want to say it publicly because they don't want to get scrutinized. But yeah, the, yeah, well, you know, you got the, you know, the keyboard bangers out yeah. there that just go crazy. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, one of the things, you know, as far as like Northwest Lyman College and, and, uh, you know, some of the stuff here, we, we coined a new phrase, uh, this year. And you probably heard it from Mark and maybe others, and it's called the first choice student. And, um, what that means to me is, um, these companies that hire our students or, or they hire from anywhere, but say they hire our students, you know, it's an investment. It's an investment in their company's future. And we got to make sure that these young people that are coming through, and if they're going to be first choice students, they got to be a great investment for that company to hire. It's going to be somebody that's going to add value to their crews, value to their culture. And um, I think all of us in the trade, you know, maybe we ought to uh, uh, take that on as a national challenge. Let, let's let's create first choice students. Let's create first choice apprentices. Let's create first choice linemen. And um, in everything that that means. And it's, you know, as an industry, we can do that. Um, and maybe that should be the mindset of how we go forward. Just the fact that you're even saying that and like, and trying to move forward in that direction. If you looked at something like, uni- like universities and colleges, mm-hmm. the traditional style and traditional way, are they saying the same thing? Or are they just, <clears throat> are they just like wanting the dollars and wanting the student and putting you out? So I see things i'll take one comment that's popping in my head that i've seen online the 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 kids that are coming out of these schools will be selling their hooks on facebook mm-hmm. in you know five days from now and they won't be using that won't be using that education well like look at every other college and university <laughs> they're selling everything if they had anything to sell when they come out of it they're selling it and not using it yeah it's only a percentage here. And the fact that we're trying Mm -hmm. to make it as best we can for this trade in this industry, just think different. It's it's, yeah. Think, think, (laughs) yeah, exactly. You know, it's, uh, um, it's and that's a small percentage, like you said, but one of the things that when these, uh, um, and I want to say kids, when these students or graduates or somebody comes out of a line school, the one thing they do know, um, say you have that or you hire off the street, right? Um, You know, if you hire them out of, out of the school, the one thing you do know is they want to do this for a living. Yeah. They just went through a pretty extensive training period that um, they got intimately uh, introduced to poles and climbing and, and doing some stuff that, you know, they do some stuff that they're never going to do the rest of their career. Yeah. You know, how many, you know, how many students or how many people out there actually worked off a hook ladder? You know, I was lucky. I got to. But, yeah. you know, if you pull 100 linemen, you know, how many of them actually got to do it? Um, however, you know, when they go through these exercises, it's, it's OK. It helps that student make their decision of is this what they want to do? So, one, when you're hiring and, we, and, and if we use that first choice, then when when a company hires them, they know basically that's what that person wants to do for a living. And they're not going to, you know, they might. And at that time, it's the company's responsibility to try to retain them. Yeah. But so say that company hires them, they retain them. And um, they're not having to have that uh, um, that initial $50,000 cost or maybe sometimes it's more. Yeah. And then that guy ends up leaving anyway and goes back to playing video games or, you know, this is just too tough. The people that that they're hiring, they actually know, you know, they got a little taste of it. They got taste of the rain. They got taste of, you know, the snow and the heat and the heights and the, 
you know, the tools. And, and uh, so at least they know this is what they want to do. Yeah. And it makes it a better hire for, for those hundreds and thousands of companies out there that hire them. Yeah. Uh, as long as those students, keep, you know, realize who they are. Yeah. Because they come out a little cocky sometimes. But that's fine, you know. Yeah, yeah. A hundred percent right. Mm-hmm. I just, again, think that people just need to be a little op- a little more open-minded mm-hmm. with regards to this stuff. Um, just because they've had one experience with one line school student that was like maybe a negative one. That's mm-hmm. one in thousands. Like mm-hmm. get over it, move on to the next, try to, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. Well, what, you know, it, you know, if I could, if I could ask somebody to think of it in a certain way, it's like, okay, we're handing you a product. Yeah. Okay, now it's your job to yeah. take over their education. Yeah. You know, we handed you a baseline product that says, okay, I want to do this for a living. I'm dumb as a box of rocks. I know enough to get in trouble. Yeah. Teach me more. And if we take on that mindset, man, think about the product that's going to come out at the end of a four-year apprenticeship. You're not handing them a journeyman lineman. Hmm. You're, <laughs> you're handing them, like you said, somebody who's just knows just enough to get themselves into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how, you know, but a majority of the time, you know, they got the right mindset. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they know they want to do this. Um, uh, they might not know why, why they want to do it. And they have not, you know, had, they haven't worked their first ice storm yet and they haven't worked, you know, yeah. um, but you know, they're, you're not going to lose them at that yeah. point, you know, yeah. but it's, it's at that time, it's those companies responsibility to, you know, a lot of them say, well, they, they, they're going to chase that 50 cents. Well, it's your job to keep them at that point. Mm-hmm. But uh, we talked a bit about history. What can we do better as linemen to preserve history? Uh, I keep talking about it. What are some things we can do? Man, call, call up the ones that taught you. Sure. Start, start the conversations. You know, we lose connection with with our past um let's let's talk to the ones that you know i i talked to some guys back you know it's shit it was like i said i started 44 years ago but i still talk to a lot of the guy uh um you know from my days in nevada and and um i think we just gotta um we draw too many lines I think we got to get away from drawing lines. I think we got to realize that the entire trade's in this together. Mm-hmm. People are going to make choices of, of what direction they want to go in the trade, and I, I think we got to be more supportive of of us all. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, whatever that whatever the future holds for us, and um, for rebuilding our our infrastructure, and it's going to take us all, and it's going to take probably double what we have today. And uh, let's just start being a little bit more respectful and, and uh, um, appreciate uh, everybody out there. You know, we have good ones. We got middle middle of the road ones. We got, but pick pick an industry that doesn't. Yeah. Um, so if we can start just being a little bit more supportive, and if you know if we have an opportunity, no matter what road they're going down, to teach somebody, teach them. And let's just see if we can't just better the trade as a whole. Um, you know, I, that's what I'd like to see. Um, you know, but but in saying that, it's a pretty damn good thing. Pretty damn good trade. Best one in the world. Yeah. There is nothing better than what we do. No, there really isn't. No. And I like uh, continuing to say their names and who they are. Mm-hmm. And like we said at the beginning, you, you know, you got that handful of people that – were your line fathers and grandfathers and like for those of you out there just know like people like me like you we say your names we say mm-hmm. your names often even if you don't think it like dave ronnie like i say your names often my old man like um i think it's important to continue we bring them up and share their stories and their beginnings and where they started. And cause if they're not talking about it, if you're not yeah. talking about it, like it dies out. Yeah. I'll probably yeah. get shot here. Cause like a lot of the guys I mentioned was from my overhead experience. So, so whining and Norville, if you see this, I love you. So yeah. that's great. <laughs> they're from my underground side. So <laughs> sorry. Underground. Guys. The, the, of course they were great overhead linemen too, yeah. but the, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> if I don't mention their names, they'll probably, yeah, they'll probably send me something in the mail. Yeah, 
the ones the the ones we lost too, like mm. Adam, like you know, if you stop saying their names, that's when they die, right? When they they die the second time, right? So it's important. Yeah, and we mentioned families a little earlier. The uh, um, I don't know, probably a turning point in my career, and I've mentioned it before in other videos. It was um, um, one of the guys in our past. I've you know we've lost many people. You know, both of us have, all of us have, and and uh, the one that had the most effect on me was um, it was a Christ the King Church in Las Vegas, and um, I won't mention his last name, but his first name was Mark, and uh, um when you watch a family uh, that goes through that. And and, um, and then, then we go out the next week and take shortcuts. It's just like, what the hell are you thinking? Yeah. You know, you just went to a funeral last week. And uh, uh, I think that was a turning point for me when I saw the strength of that, that wife, uh, widow, and their small kids. It was just like, that was, that was a turning point in my career. So... You know, but yet we we will go out there and take shortcuts. And, you know, historically, we still have 40 or 50 linemen that die every single year. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say possibly needlessly, you know, because there's always one event that changes in that day that changes that accident. And um, we haven't fixed that yet. It shouldn't even have to come to that. It shouldn't have to come to like an incident like that. And every single lineman can think of right now if just stop just even it even popped into your head just me saying this think of that moment you mm-hmm. had that was your holy shit and if you're lucky it was only one moment mm-hmm. usually it's dozens in your career were like yeah it's, that was an inch away mm-hmm. or you know that was a moment right there where i need to take a breath take a breather mm-hmm. pause and, we, and we've all we have all I had them and people that are listening are going to have them. Um, but what do we do about it? You know, so, you know, that's, I would go back to that mirror and just say, you know, better ask that guy in the mirror why we're doing some of the stuff we're doing. So you've been a leader, uh, your whole career, it seems like, or the latest half <laughs> of it anyway. Yes, sir. Um, what does a good leader look like to you? Um, you know, there's all. I'm I'm a I'm a student of leadership. I'm um, probably not many books out there that I haven't read about leadership or whatever. But it's um, a good leader is is. Um, I will mention one book, um, Extreme um, Ownership. Uh, yep. And uh, there's there's statements in that book about uh, success is a team sport basically, but failure is an individual. Um, so it doesn't matter what the failure was. If you're a leader, you're at fault, no matter what that is, um, because you were in charge. Um, and they tell a story about boat crews in that book and, and, uh, how changing the leader from boat crew to boat crew. And and then all of a sudden now the other boat was winning because they changed the leader. So it's, uh, so, you know, you gotta be a, a, a student of leadership, but, um, the perfect leader to me or a good leader to me is one that uh, um, listens, um, uh, creates collaboration in, in, in their path and is a people person um, because you're managing people. You're not managing widgets. Um, so you're going to have to realize strengths and you're going to have to um, just realize it. And then also where, you know, and it depends on what type what type of leadership you're doing. Is it for a project? Is it on a line mm-hmm. crew? Is it? Um, but I think it's somebody that cares about people, and uh, I think that's one of the biggest traits of a great leader. Um, but um, you know, there's all kinds of methods and and procedures and policies, all kinds of things you can be uh, um, when you're when you're a student of leadership. But it's it comes down to at the end of the day. Will people follow you? Yeah, and um, and if they follow you for the right reasons, then you're then you're doing a pretty decent job. That's why I love asking everybody that question because everyone's really got a different answer for it. But a lot of them follow a similar thread. Mm-hmm. I uh, I saw a guy. I think it was must have been on social media say this thing: what a good what a good leader is to him. And 
it kind of, I started thinking about it and I really, really liked it. It said a leader's number one job of a leader is to limit the fear Mm. to their team is Mm -hmm. to take that whatever it is that's happening and minimize the fear so that people can follow. I thought it was like, I hadn't heard that one before and started thinking about it and kind of started using it and talking to people I know about that. But the more I think about it is like, yeah, that's what your job as a leader as well Mm. is like take that, minimize the fear and go to your team and be that strength. Right. Like that's that's actually pretty brilliant. I'll, I'll I'll refer back to Aaron Howe, our founder. And, uh, and then I'll say, and, um, when you say remove fear and a lot of times it's fear of making mistakes. Yep. And, uh, so Aaron used to say, you know, get it out of the way, make a freaking big one, man. Yeah. You know, just get it out of the way that we don't have to worry about it and then we'll manage it afterwards. So and it's just true. like, so that was probably one of the first things he, he, he mentored me on like eight years ago. And it's, uh, um, of course, Aaron and Alan and, and, uh, I can't, I can't, you know, Aaron can talk like Alan. I can't, but uh, the, uh, but they'll say, you know, just make, make it big, you know, me, you know, it's just, that was horrible. But, uh, um, don't, don't be, don't be afraid of making the mistake because then you're, you're not, you're not getting to the, p- the potential. Um, you're not getting to the expectations that people set because you're, you know, and and don't be don't be fearful don't be afraid to to ask and that goes right back to the trade a lot of times you know mm-hmm. you know a lot of young guys won't ask and uh so yeah that's actually i'm stealing that one absolutely <laughs> so, i stole it from him so there you go. i really liked it and i've been like i've been saying it out loud to other people and i've kind of got that response from kind of everyone i've told it to mm. i really like that it's uh and it's hard right it's hard it's that's also like uh, one thing about it is it's hard to take that as a person, right? Cause like you're taking the full force of what, whatever that is and you're blocking it for your team. Mm-hmm. And you're going, I'll take this. You know what guys, we're fine. Mm-hmm. We got this. We'll go this way, that way. We'll do this thing, but it's being able to take that and then not just distribute that fear amongst your team yep. to get all worried so that they can excel at what they're doing. Cause <laughs> as a leader, you need your team to do their jobs mm-hmm. Like that's really what it's about. Like you're working for them, right? They're not working for like for you. That and we get it twisted all the time. Yeah, yeah. You think, oh, as a leader, I'm the big grand poomba. You know, it's like no, you're just uh, you're you're the you're the first one that it, you know you're you're taking responsibility for failure. Yeah. Um, but the other, I think another key word is empowerment. You Correct. know, you're empowering those people to to take charge to, to, um, you know, you're painting, you know, probably another thing a good leader does is, is, is paints the picture, but doesn't paint the outcome Mm. because the outcome might be different that your team takes you than maybe, and maybe it's better than maybe the outcome that you had envisioned. So, you know, you know, paint, paint a picture of, of what you, what you want done, um, and then empower them to do it and have faith in them to do it. Don't worry, you know, if they make a mistake, you'll fix it. Um, um, so I, I think empowerment plays a lot into it also. Yeah. And, and confidence, give them the confidence to, you know, and the trust, uh, you know, that as soon as, uh, you know, a leader's going to die as soon as it's about him. And, you know, you might as well just, you're not going to make it if that's your, if that's what you think. Another, like the greatest thing you can do along with empowering is like, it is empowering, but you got to recognize what they're good at Mm -hmm. and you got to try your best to put them in a position that they can excel at the thing they're good at and want to do. So if you're taking them and putting them in in something else that they hate and they don't want to do, how empowered are they going to feel and how amazing are they going to do at that thing? Mm -hmm. Probably not very amazing unless, you know, you're coaching them into something else, but that's, yeah, I mean, you got to recognize what they're good at and put them in that position. Absolutely. To you know, you got to put them in position to, to succeed the, but uh, I know something that I've done a horrible job at and maybe other people and other companies do is we don't do a great job at succession planning. You yes, know? we don't. So say a foreman on the crew Love and that. you know, we're, we have a certain job that maybe we can sit back, l- let, let your lead lineman run it. Let, let what your first class lineman. Yeah. Um, 
the uh, one of the things that my line father Chris used to do is we could have done the job hot, but he would go down and he'd climb the junction pole and he'd lift the lead and we'd throw a ground on it. And then, I, you know, as a cold apprentice, he'd go, okay, this line's hot, which it wasn't, but okay, now you do the job as is it like it's hot. And it, it's so, you know, can we do more of that? Yeah. You know, let's put people in the positions to get ready for that next step. Yeah. You know, as, as, as a first class lineman, as a lead lineman, as a foreman, as a GF, I think as companies, we do a horrible job at succession planning. I agree. Um, and Again, whatever that it's, means. it's out of fear, right? Mm-hmm. It's out of fear that you're going to lose your job. Mm-hmm. But in fact, that just clears a path for you to excel in something else. Yep. And they talk about that in extreme ownership too, and that decentralized mm-hmm. command, they call it yep. from the military yep. or whatever. Absolutely. But that is 100% right. I remember um, as a as a foreman myself, I used to bring the apprentice in and we used to get on the radio to dispatch or to whoever's giving your permits, your live line permits or whatever, and be like, Hey, I got my seventh step here with me today. I want to get him going through this and learning how mm-hmm. to pull permits. And I'm here with them, coaching them through it. Let's work, you know, mm-hmm. and as long as it wasn't a super busy day and that dispatch was in a good mood and okay, let's, let's do this. Yeah. And yeah, it's another way to like, you got to pass that baton mm-hmm. on, right? Like, yeah. And it's just, you know, it's a way to improve the trade as a whole. Yeah. You know, a whole lot of small steps make, you know, a, a big accomplishment. Mm-hmm. So that's something else, we, you know, that's something else we can identify that we can all do better at. Yeah. So I know I've been I just recently in this last year, it's something that, you know, if you look back and you're honest, there were situations in the last year that I really needed to be doing better succession planning. And, uh, you know, and if you're willing to take a look at that and, and, you know, put yourself on the hot seat, you know, just improves it for the future. It's not fun. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. But sometimes it's good to be a little uncomfortable. I talked to the kids yesterday. Uh, kids, I keep calling them, I always call them kids, but the students yesterday. Yeah. And uh, well, 50 of them or so down in one of the rooms, teaching rooms there. And they asked this question, uh, what can I, what can we be doing or what can I do to help you know, better myself. And I think they were looking for a little bit more like of the technical side of things, Mm -hmm. but I said, you know, improve your soft skills, Uh, become a good communicator, you know, things like that. Like, and I said, um, leadership is something that's extremely hurting in the trades. It's in the world today. It seems like you look at every, you know, leader at that high level and there's a big question mark on every single one of them. Yeah. Um, the world needs better leaders. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like talking about it. I'm not professing that I'm any great, you know, person on like a great leader myself, but like, I like talking about it and asking people these questions because the world needs better leaders. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, we could even, we could even drive that a little deeper. There's different levels of leadership. You know, a groundman on the crew can be a leader. Yes. You know, he can be an example, the apprentice the you know, yep. so we all have opportunities to lead or have leadership moments. Um, and we, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, eat a sandwich standing up, you know, that's just something we used to talk about it. But, you know, think about uh, the lesson that teaches if, you know, you got a cold apprentice or a hot apprentice that is sitting there and the, and the groundman sitting on the ground or whatever. So a leadership moment. You know, then that groundman learns that, okay, this is what the expectations are and stuff. So even if it's on the line crew or life, um, there's opportunities to, to, to lead at every, at every turn, uh, no matter the level. So there's, you know, there's levels. It's human so. nature. You put a group of, you know, pre-apprentices together or a group of new linemen together. Or li- well, line. Somebody's coming out of that group. Mm-hmm. the leader of the group. Mm-hmm. It's how we organize. Yep. <laughs> like this is naturally how we organize. If you learn how to be that person. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, so say we're, uh, you know, a lot of the kids and a lot of the people on younger people on the crews are going to be on the road working storms and stuff. You know, they're going to be put in positions where they got to make decisions. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily leading at that point, but you're making the appropriate decision that you're not going to put yourself in harm's way. You're not going to, you know, been a, a lot of times I remember laying on some cardboard boxes and, and we were doing some dead work on the 500 and we're just praying that the dispatch order doesn't come through because the night before wasn't a lot of great decisions. 
And uh, so all of a sudden we, hear, you know, we hear the line go off and we're like, uh, so, you know, be a leader, make the right decisions. Um, it's gonna gonna make your career a lot better. Learn how to just make a decision. Let's, let's a decision. start with that. Yeah, there's nothing. We've all been in a group of people that can't make a decision. You know, where do you want to go eat? I don't know. There, there, there. Just make it. Make a decision. Let's go with it. Yeah. Good, bad, ugly, whatever it is. Somebody, somebody choose what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just be that person. It's like, okay, I got an idea. Let's go with this. Yeah. Okay. You know. Yeah, and then and. You know, if things start to go down the wrong road, make a decision to not put yourself in it. Yeah. You know, but that's all stuff that they're, they're going to learn through the years. Yeah. But the, uh, um, but that all that goes all into that leadership discussion. Yeah. What does uh, you said you got five years left ish? Mm. What does that look like for you? What's up for the next few years for Bill? Right here. Yeah. Yeah. The um, I. Uh, I, I recently, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, I uh, made a decision. I went to go work for, uh, I had been here about six, six and a half years, and I made a decision to go work for a great company, yep. great people. Um, um, but um, for whatever reason, I made that decision, and, and uh, um, you know, I knew I needed to come home. So... Yeah, I'm gonna retire here unless they get rid of me. <laughs> so there's, um, but I want to make sure that uh, I give opportunities to to young, and I can't even say young people anymore because yeah. we we got students that are coming here at 40, 50 years I old, know. and uh, so great opportunities. That is, that's really cool too. You yeah. know, like so I, I I want to I want to work with as many companies. I want to work with as many as many apprentices, as many pre apprentices, as many students. Um, um, I this is where I want to. This is how I want to end my career, my official career, and then hopefully in five years, um, I speak. Uh, I'm, I I don't know. I I speak all over the nation on on the line trade and leadership and different things. So when I retire from here, say five six years, um, I want to continue to do that. Um, if you know. I, what the, what the hell is retirement? I mean, yeah. who, who wants to retire? No. Um, so uh, my official career will end here, but then after that, I want to continue speaking across the nation on the line trade and and uh, just helping the trade wherever I can. That's I want to do that till I die and be a good husband and father. But uh, that. that's how I want to end it. Love that. You know, and there better be one hell of a party at the end of the road. Heck yeah. <laughs> So, no, that's amazing. So, um, well, thanks for being on the show, man. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah. If you ever got anything else you want to talk about, open. I open told you it was dangerous getting me talking. No, it's <laughs> so, all good. You know, hour and a half blows by like Is that an hour. hour and a half? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Thanks for oh, being on the thank show. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. All right, guys. Once again, hope you got some value out of the episode. I know I did. I enjoy every single one of these conversations, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. One more time for the folks in the back. If you could like, subscribe, follow, make sure you're following either in audio form and video form on YouTube. Much appreciated. All right, guys, play safe. Peace.